I want to welcome you to another Pod for Israel, and I have with us Dr. David Mishkin. He's going to be teaching a Zoom course soon on the biblical festivals of God. So, Dr. Mishkin, what's some of the main things that you take away when you look at the festivals that people get wrong? Well, what they get wrong, I, I think people have a lot of ideas, but what the festivals are all about, first of all, it was a way for God's people to commune with him. Right. We see in the Torah, the five books of Moses, a lot of people say, oh, that's a, those are law books. Well, yes, there are obviously a lot of laws in them, right. but it's really one long narrative but the laws are there for different reasons, to tell us about the holiness of God, to tell us about right and wrong ways to act. But even God wants to uh, give us occasions for worship. So every year in the ancient calendar, uh, we see specifically in Leviticus 23, here are the seven biblical feasts. And actually the chapter begins with the Sabbath. So we see a pattern. Every seven days, there's one special day, that's the Sabbath. Right. And in the rest of the chapter, in every one biblical calendar year, there are seven special festivals. So it's one in seven, seven in one. And if you go through the chapter, you'll see that number seven popping up all over the place. Sometimes it's right. the number of sacrifices. Sometimes it's the number of weeks between one festival and the next. Uh, three very important festivals in the fall are actually in the seventh month of the Jewish calendar. So we see a pattern and that's good because we, uh, we meaning human beings, we're, we're often forgetful. But right. in our calendar, every week, in fact, we're reminded by the Sabbath of, of God's love for us, of God's creation, mm -hmm. and throughout the year. So if you lived in ancient Israel, it would have been kind of hard to miss all the ways that God is communicating. And that was one of the reasons he did it, so that we would never be too far from having an opportunity to learn from him. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think you really brought up so much of the depth that's in these festivals. It's not just a bunch of thou shalt do this and bring the sacrifice on this day, or yada, yada, yada. A lot of people, I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that they view these as something that, oh, this is the Old Testament and that's just, oh, we can study, but that's not really relevant to us. It's not really, that's more of just speaking of the law and the drudgery that they had to go through and do all these things and ordinances. But what you're saying is, number one, there's a lot of depth and symbolism, but that all points is kind of like God's curriculum to tell us the narrative of salvation, right? Absolutely. And we need to start with the truth that all scripture is God breathed. So whether right. something's in the Old Testament or the New Testament, it is in fact scripture. The exactly. other question might be, well, what does it mean for us? And Good. we see in the festivals, it was not only a way for ancient Israel to gather themselves and be before God, but it's also prophetically speaking about the Messiah. And I think right. uh, you, you mentioned some misconceptions. I think most Christians will understand if we say Jesus is the Passover lamb, because each yeah. of the four gospels, uh, obviously Passover plays a major role, but what they may not know is that all the festivals in one way or another are again, telling us about God's holiness, giving us insight into the coming Messiah, we could read about how Jesus either fulfilled uh, and or observed these festivals. And sometimes we even have clues as to our future, what mm. God has planned in the future through these festivals. So I think right. all believers, just to know what scripture said, just yeah. to get the context, if we're looking at the life of Yeshua, uh, it's very valuable. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't read the New Testament and even, even like, Acts is full of like life centering around these appointed days, these biblical feasts. So this is not a Old Testament concept. This is very much a New Testament concept and it's revealed. You see more revelation happening inside that through the lens of Yeshua, but it's just as relevant for us today as it was back then. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the festivals are also fun. Um, yeah, you know, it's not sure. always correct to say feasts on Yom Kippur. You don't get to eat, so <laughs> yeah, that's not that's true. accurately a feast. Yeah. And we may not use the word fun to talk about Yom Kippur, but still important. And I would even say 
to believers today. Yom Kippur was the day. We see it first in Leviticus 16. The whole chapter talks about the, the ceremonies of the high priest and the bulls and the goats and all days. We may not have those ceremonies. We definitely don't because there's no yeah, exactly. tabernacle or temple. But what can we be learning through that? Well, yeah. God's holiness and even believers, somebody who already is a committed follower of Jesus, somebody who's born again, uh, doesn't need to be born again again. No, that's true. Right. But every day, uh, we want to draw closer to God. Every yeah. day, we want to examine ourselves, and we want to repent of what we did yesterday or last week. Uh, so it reminds us of the problem of sin, the unique solution that God has to sin, which is ultimately Jesus, the ultimate Passover lamb, or he takes the place of the bulls and goats on Yom Kippur for the once and for all atonement that God has provided. So these things are important even for for Christians who already know that uh, they're forgiven because they have Jesus. Uh, It helps us in our sanctification, our daily walk of getting closer to God. Yeah, that's true. And you know, when you look at that, you know, you, you mentioned the fall festivals. Most, I think most Christians around the world, they're very aware, like you said, of Passover. Many are also aware of Pentecost, although they probably wouldn't know the, the, the biblical name, the Feast of Shavuot. Shavuot, so the Feast of Weeks. So you have probably some people who know of, of these spring festivals, but the fall festivals are much more obscure to most people around the world, to many now, a lot of our viewers are probably totally educated and into this stuff, but but many people, this might be the first time you're hearing about these in a, in the context of Yeshua. So, well, if we look at the three fall festivals, we get a great outline for the gospel. Now, the first one, the English translation uh, is usually trumpets or the feast of trumpets. Literally, in the Hebrew, it would translate to the day of the blowing or the sounding. It doesn't mention a shofar or a trumpet, which Mm -hmm. is interesting. So it's known commonly as the Feast of Trumpets. And that was a time to sound the alarm because only uh, 10 days later, we would have Yom Kippur. And it's interesting, if you lived in ancient Israel, it would be kind of hard to forget everything that God is saying because once a week, you've got the Sabbath. Once yeah. a month, you have the, the New Moon Festival. You've got all of these other festivals throughout the year. Later, God sent the prophets, always saying, repent. But just in case you missed all of that, once a year on the calendar, on the day of the blowing, or what's commonly called trumpets, it was a special day to examine our relationship with God mm-hmm or our lack of relationship with God. And we go into what in tradition became known as the 10 days of awe. So that's Mm -hmm. the first part of the gospel message, recognizing the problem, recognizing that sin separates us from God. Then on the day of atonement, now we're gonna go to God because only he has the solution for the sin problem. And to, today, let, let me just, uh, you know, people try philosophy or drugs or whatever. Those aren't real solutions. So uh, the feast of the blowing of the trumpets is really about repentance. Yom Kippur is about redemption. And then the third festival really is about rejoicing. And we could even throw in return, but that maybe is another yeah. conversation. I mean, wow, you know, we've we've spoken about this a, a bit on some of our podcasts. And I, I, that's why I really encourage viewers, if you haven't signed up for... Uh, Dr. Mishkin's course on these biblical appointed days, you really, really need to sign up because we're going to be able to go into a lot more depth than we've ever been able to do on podcasts or anything like that in this Zoom course. So if you're interested, definitely sign up. But, you know, you talked about how it points to the gospel. It, it's amazing. You also see the same thing in the New Testament. You know, the Apostle Paul talks about our high priest, unlike the priesthood, you know, going once a year to atone, you know, into the Holy of Holies, you know, not without blood. He explains how Yeshua is the greater high priest and how he is our atonement. He is both our atonement, both the lamb sacrifice and also the priest who's offering the atonement. And, you know, we've spoken in past podcasts about how, how beautiful it is, you know, where you don't do anything on Yom Kippur. You can't bring that sacrifice. You look to the high priest with faith. And that's, that's the, your work is the work of faith. You know, like you're actually believing in the high priest's work in the same way we're believing we're resting 
in Yeshua's finished work. Yeah, the festivals are called a shadow of something, actually someone greater, right. ultimately Jesus. But uh, shadow doesn't mean, okay, it's irrelevant. Now that we have uh, the real thing, we should forget about all the festivals. No, we still learn a lot. There are a lot of principles being taught. The ultimate fulfillment, if we're talking about both the uh, the lamb uh, of God or both the sacrifice itself and the high priest. The ultimate fulfillment, of course, is only in Jesus. But just looking at the festivals, as we'll do in this course, gives us a lot of background uh, to help us learn even more about Jesus. Yeah, and I think one thing we were speaking of ahead of time is we, we were talking about how interwoven, one, the narrative of salvation. In other words, as you read through the prophets, you see both at the same time, in the same chapter, you'll see the suffering servant and the reigning king, especially in Isaiah. It's interwoven. You you see both his humiliation and, and the despair of his persecution, and you see his glorious kingdom coming, his reigning. So you see these intermixed so much in the prophets, but also in these festivals, you see both the first and the second coming really in both fall and spring feast, even though definitely spring feast has more emphasis on the direct fulfillment that happened as he laid down his life, as he rose on the feast of first fruits and on the Pentecost, the Holy spirit being poured out. But you also see some shadows of the Exodus story and of the end times. You could say the end times Exodus story is uh, as the Messiah returns, you know, our revelation story. Well, I think uh, probably most of the people who will be part of, uh, who will be listening to the course, know at least to some extent what Passover is. They might be less familiar with, as you're saying, throughout the prophets, there's this idea that there's a new Exodus yeah. coming, something yeah. greater. And, uh, you know, in the same way, all of the prophets are talking about a new covenant. Now, only mm. Jeremiah used those specific words, uh, in Jeremiah 31, 31, a new covenant, but they were all talking about something, something's brewing, something's right, coming. Right. And as you said, it combines uh, the first and second coming of Jesus. But in the same way, all of the prophets are talking about a greater exodus. Mm. So in that way, uh, the Passover talks about what God did in the time of Moses. And that gives us the ability to look ahead because he did that we have every reason to believe that when he promises a new and greater exodus, he's going to do that as well. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, I think that that just really hammers home the idea of that these festivals are relevant for followers of Yeshua around the world. For It's not a Jewish festival and then the Christians have their thing. No, this is these are our festivals. We're connected to that same root and all of it speaks to the glory of Yeshua, of what he's done and what he will do. And it's just amazing to study that. For me, it strengthened my faith amazingly. Sure. For example, in Zechariah chapter 14, he talks about, really, it's an amazing passage where God's legs will touch down on the Mount of Olives. Well, is this an anthropomorphism? Is this a metaphor? Right, right. This might be the first thing we'll think, but we also know in the first couple of chapters in the book of Acts that when Yeshua... Uh, went up to heaven, we learn that he's going to come back in the same manner. He was on the Mount of Olives. We know right. he's coming back to the Mount of Olives. So when we put those two things together, it's kind of amazing. So what else happens in Zechariah 14? Okay, we see that God's legs will touch down on uh, the Mount of Olives, and it Cracks talks up. about <laughs> a lot of amazing things, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Uh, uh, a river which is both literal and and uh, symbolic at the same time, yeah. will flow from Jerusalem. And it talks about living water, but it yeah. also talks about Jews and Gentiles uh, celebrating Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles together. Right. Right. So that's really the beginning of the millennial kingdom, that yeah. chapter, that as well as some other chapters. So we see in the future, it's also important, Jews and Gentiles together celebrating yeah. these ancient feasts. I think we have to understand this is not a, the Gentiles being a part, the nations being a part of these festivals is not a New Testament revelation in the future someday concept. In fact, it in the Torah itself, it really had a lot to say about how, you know, basically people who followed the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would participate in these festivals. 
They were invited to participate. They were in, that was always God's heart was for Israel to be a royal priesthood, right? So yeah, the way uh, the Old Testament, uh, in, in a sense, God's ecclesiology, if we could use that term in the Old Testament, right. it's Israel and the nations, always Israel and the nations. Well, we have some idea, okay, who, who do we mean by uh, uh, Israel? Well, later to be called the Jewish people from Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, through the 12, and the nations, well, that's easy, anybody who's not part of uh, the children of Israel, but the way the Old Testament portrays the nations, it's both uh, sometimes the powers that oppose God's plan, whether it's mm. Pharaoh mm -hmm. or Assyria, Babylon, etc. Right. but at the same time, especially in the book of Psalms, we see that the nations are also to be the recipients of this good news, right. which will be brought about through God's plan of choosing Israel. Right. Like, you know, some people have heard the restoration of the tabernacle of David, you know, restoring the tabernacle of David. And of course, as you read about David's life, there was a lot of people in his cabinet, you could say, yeah. who were uh, from the nations. Uh, you know, these were proselytes, people who came under the shadow of, of Israel's wings, you could say, uh, like Ruth, you know, she was a Moabitess. She was actually an untouchable. And she w said, you know, my, you know, to Naomi, like your God is my God. I, I want to follow you. I want to go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. You know, there's, there's been those people throughout history. And as we read through the Tanakh and the Torah, but uh, what, what we see uh, in the New Testament is both on one hand in Christ, uh, there is no Jew or Greek or Jew and exactly. Gentile. Um, and uh, the middle wall of partition has come down and one new man. But at the same time, in this world, uh, yeah. before Yeshua comes back, God, I believe, is still working through uh, the people of Israel, both the people and the land. It doesn't mean every person who is Jewish is automatically uh, yeah. in the kingdom, uh, very much so. That's not what it is. Uh, everybody Jewish, or whether you're born Jewish or born Gentile, you must be born again. But I'm just saying that God has a plan uh, yeah. and he's using the festivals. He's using the Jewish people for all people to come to recognize God. And these festivals, they're really God's curriculum to teach his people, you know, Jew and Gentile, to teach them the narrative of salvation, to teach them the work that he would do and reconciling us back to him. Yeah, it's very much, uh, you know, I grew up uh, celebrating the festivals and, you know, Passover was always a lot of fun and you're probably familiar with the Seder and all the different elements. Right. Before there was the internet and before there were laser light shows yeah. and before there were television, you know, there was television. Mm -hmm. How did we interact with more than just words? Mm -hmm. Oh, matzah. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 you know, <laughs> and for things that are very spicy, that reminds us of bitterness. Oh, yeah. okay. I could understand that. I could teach it. So it's really a teaching device. It's true. Uh, all of the festival. Why do we live in booths during uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. Mm -hmm. Well, it mm -hmm. reminds us of several things, the wilderness wanderings. It reminds us that God uh, was really the only one we could trust. Today, we might live in a house made of brick and concrete and is very secure. Yeah. A tabernacle, uh, a sukkah, mm -hmm. is intentionally very flimsy because we're supposed to be remembering God. And it was also a time... Uh, to remember the harvest and God's provision of water. So having an actual booth that you could live in for a week is a lot more than just saying, okay, let's remember what they did in the olden days. Yeah. And see, that's, you could say there's the Greek way of learning and knowledge. And then there's the biblical way, which is experiencing, like stepping into, you know, and the four, the all four senses, not just in your head, but you experience it physically. And so I, you know, we've had plenty of studies today that have shown that that's actually the most effective way to really train and teach is more experiential basis and involving the four senses really hammers home the point. I, I think we can all agree the best teacher ever in history is God. And yes. he's, he, he knows how to train us <laughs> the, the best way.
I'm really excited about this course. I'm excited for people to learn and go deeper into this uh, into this subject, which I think is incredibly important for yeah, us to understand. We will talk not only about the seven festivals in Leviticus 23. Uh, we're actually going to have one course on the biblical calendar, which is a, a, a lecture in itself, the first lecture. Somebody will speak on the Sabbath and... Uh, again, apart from Leviticus 23, we'll have some later festivals, including uh, Purim, which is the celebration of the book of Esther, right. and also Hanukkah. Uh, everybody, uh, most Americans, for example, they think Hanukkah is like the Jewish Christmas uh, <laughs> because it falls usually around the same time of year, usually right. within a few yeah. weeks. Uh, it's not on one hand, yeah. uh, but it is important and it's biblical because in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 22, exactly. Uh, Jesus was not only in Jerusalem celebrating Hanukkah, his words in that passage bring bring us new meaning when we understand a little bit more about For sure. the, what happened in in the original uh, events that we're celebrating. For sure. And you know, and like like what we said, you can't understand you can't understand his words that he spoke at at the feast of dedication, which is Hanukkah. You can't understand what he was saying, unless you understand the context yeah. of it all. We, we don't really understand it completely unless we get the context. And this is, this is incredibly important. This is important, not just for you to understand so you have better Bible studies, but I, I would say if you're a father and a mother, it's important to, to understand how to convey this to your kids, because this was the main way of training up your children in the day is taking them through these this cycle of festivals. And it's not line upon line and do this and do that. It's more of for us to understand and to study it, we get a better perspective of God and we get a better perspective of the glory of God and how he conveyed this love story to us. And uh, along with all of that, the final class in this 10-week uh, series or in this 10-week course is about the festivals of modern Israel. And here are festivals that probably... Most uh, American Christians, for example, are much less familiar with. So they're not necessarily biblical, uh, but I do think they're important uh, because uh, the Jewish people and the land of Israel, as I said, is still part of God's plan. And uh, just as you said, the best way to teach is for it to be interactive. What yeah. do we do on this day? Oh, everyone knows we do this. We don't do that. And uh, it becomes part of the calendar every year. We know we do yeah. that. So it's a great teaching device. Well, it's really exciting. Well, I understand many people might not be able to take the course because of the schedule and timing. We'll eventually be able to get these on, on demand. But basically my prayer for you is that you guys start to study and dig into these festivals because it, it strengthened my faith in an amazing way. The deeper I go every year, I learn something new. I've been doing it for a long time. And every year you're learning something fresh. I mean, I don't know about you, but there's always something that comes out fresh for me every year. Yeah, I, I've, for example, uh, been to a Passover Seder, I would say, every single year of my life. Right. And yeah. we, we try to keep it fresh. I mean, certain things are built into the Seder. There are only so many cups. There are only so many right. questions, yeah, et course, cetera. Yeah. Yeah. But we try to go deeper rather than just doing it by rote, kind of like... Uh, in churches where they observe communion, where they celebrate communion, it might be every week, it might be once a month, there's always a time of preparation and prayer. So it's not just uh, by rote. Let's really remember what we're doing here. Yeah. Why are we doing this? What does it mean? And that could be very helpful. And with that, these ancient customs can can still come to life. Yeah. Well, Lord, we just pray for all of our all of our listeners, that they would be encouraged this week, that they would know the depth of God's love, that they would hear his love story in a fresh new way, and that you would just awaken our hearts to the passion that you put into telling the story to us and how much you love us. And uh, just pray for David in this course, that you would just bless it, and you'd bless our re uh, listeners today in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen.